Spectre is the 26th James Bond film, 24th if we're only talking about official uh, Eon productions mm -hmm. by the Broccoli family. I had a correction ready there as soon as you said 26. But yeah, because yeah. the two that we're not including, Casino yeah. Royale, in which Bond is played by various people, principally David Niven. And I Never haven't even said anything yet and you're being pedantic. And Never Say Never Again, in which Bond is played by Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. Sean, uh, Daniel Craig, this is his fourth outing as James Bond. As the sixth James No. Anyway, anyway, um, the first one being Casino Royale, mm -hmm. then Quantum of Solace, mm -hmm. then Skyfall, mm -hmm. and now Spectre. Skyfall was a huge hit all over the world, one of the most successful Bond films ever made. It was. And with this success, um, Sam Mendes, the director, is back, Oscar winning director with American, from American Beauty. The film uh, Spectre is coming off the back of this colossal success, so you would have thought that the producers, the Broccoli family and others, would say to Sam Mendes and the scriptwriters, let's try something this time, let's really, you know, let's, let's have a little bit of a gamble. You would have had a little bit of more freedom. Yeah. And do you think that's happened? Well, I, I think the final product certainly isn't. I think this is um, what I've referred to this week as safety net filmmaking. I think this is the fourth Daniel Craig film, the first of which was Casino Royale, uh, with which they kind of revamped everything, right? And this is trying too hard to connect with the other three films, with the previous three films. And I, I don't think that's what James Bond's about. Um, because I think there's very little connective tissue from one film to the next. Well, what and about I, you? But you always have M, you always have Q, you always have gadgets. You yes, have but Nick I mean narrative-wise, because there are explicit and frequent references with which this, the, the overriding plot and emphasis in this film is kind of like, and we'll get into the, what the plot is. Well, we might as well give a, a brief pricey. In, 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 in this film, James Bond discovers that there is some shadowy organisation which has mm -hmm. got all sorts of evil plans, mm -hmm. which may or may not be connected with the three villains in the previous uh, Daniel Craig films. It turns out to be called Spectre. It turns out to have these shadowy meetings in Rome, isn't it? Mm -hmm. where, where they have yeah. the shadowy meetings. Bond goes to the shadowy meeting. He and sees the head of it, who's Franz yeah. Oberhauser, played by Christoph Waltz. Um, that he has a meeting with Mr. White from Quantum of Solace, whose daughter is Madeleine Swan, played by Leia. I can't even remember Quantum of Solace. Played play by Leia. I was like, I, I guess he's in it. Yeah, because yeah. um, there were like various villains in that one. Mm. He um, goes to meet Leia Seydoux because she knows how to get to the Spectre headquarters and all this kind of thing. They apparently fall in love, but this is more a matter of something that we're told rather than something that we actually feel. Mm. Um, he is then, um, he, in, in, uh, he is taken to the headquarters of Spectre, which is in the middle of the desert, or the, or the, <laughs> or, or the lair of Blofeld. He always seems one step behind his adversaries in this, yeah. which I guess is a kind of, um, you know, it's a novel idea. Yeah. He, he, Bond seems in the, in the... Is he a bit thick? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think he's as witty as other James Bonds have been. Mm -hmm. Like Roger Moore? Um, <laughs> Pierce Brosnan had moments of wit. Oh, absolutely. Oh. But for me, I think that's a general um, problem with these four films, right? So we have Casino Royale, released a year after Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. No, uh, sorry, Batman Begins. All right, right. And I think that ushered in this new era of coming back to this connective tissue. The idea that these kind of impossibly cool protagonists can also be psychologically complicated human beings, right? And I don't think, whereas, you know, Batman, obviously that isn't the case, it can't be. I think they're an inherently silly material, and I think it's pretentious to pretend it's you know, otherwise, because the, James, Bond, James Bond, James Bond do, do, we, there is such a thing as the secret intelligence service that we do have espionage agents man, around the world. Yes, and you know, but, there the, is but, a, but the chances of them being a glamorous white tuxedo wearing debonair, insouciant, uh, womanizing shit is probably quite low. And in fact, real spies are much more like George Smiley, faceless people that you would just pass on the street and never even look at look at a, look at it in, in yeah. a second. But I can buy into the, all that, you know, womanizing right. misogyny, right? The casual misogyny and the kind of, you know, this guy who's ostensibly a defender of an imperialistic realm. Um, just to break in, how, how do you understand, how do you explain the fact that Daniel Craig is generally unpopular with men and generally very popular with women? And if he was such a misogynist, wouldn't most women be saying, well, why should we like this guy who's nasty to our sisters? Yeah, but you know, the, the, as we know, the 
at least the British public never knows what's good for them. Right. <laughs> um, as so, you know, the so, reason so, why so. we have a, 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 a total duck in a Parliament, the head of Parliament. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the only way I can flippantly respond to that. Right. But you can't deny that this is a casually misogynistic character. He doesn't actively, explicitly hate women. Are you saying the Daniel? Are you saying the Daniel? Are you saying the Daniel? System. Are you saying the Daniel Craig Bond? Because no, I think the core elements of the character. Right, because right. obviously Bond itself is sixty-two years old. The yes. books and then the films and all this kind of thing, and you have all this backstory. And these films make a point of saying none of that happened. Mm -hmm. They're saying in the, in this film we see a, a, an official document that says James Bond. He's 12 years old in 1983. Yeah, he's the same age as you in this film. He's the film. same age as me in this film, so I feel particularly invested in the character. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is a Bond who in 1971 was being born, whereas in fact in 1971, Diamonds Are Forever was coming out. Yeah. Sean Connery was not an infant. Yeah. In that well, film. it's an awkward timeline reboot, right, yeah. with Casino Royale, which kind of was designed, and these films are very much designed, and Craig was designed as a diametric opposite to what the Brosnan Bond had become. Because the Brosnan right. Bond had become a bit more like Roger Moore. I know that Joe made a lot of money, but it wasn't respected by a very loyal fan base. And that's important, right? It's not just about com commerce here, right? Ooh, the Bond, I, I think that's I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what the Bond things are about if they're not about commerce. No, they, no, they, no they, of, they, of course they, they are, but I'm they, saying it's not the only thing. Uh, because I think it's the only thing. Really? I really think it's the only thing. The only, the only time there have been hiatuses in Bond, or there's been a problem with Bond, is when the film that they're making hasn't made as much money as they thought it was going to make. And so they have to have a pause, they have to find a way, how do we reconnect this? Um, and so like, there's, a, there's a certain year gap before Daniel Craig is found, and, mm -hmm. and they think, right, now, now the public is ready for this. Because at a certain point, Bond, Bond becomes a joke, Bond becomes silly, Bond becomes too familiar, Bond, people don't want to see it, so they have a few years off, they bring a new guy back and they say, oh, remember that James Bond that you used to like? Mm -hmm. Here he is again, reimagined for Hence why I think, you know, even within the Craig years, there's three years between Quantum of Solace and Skyfall, and otherwise there's only been two years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two or three years, we, we get a new James Bond, we know what it's going to be, it does what it says on the tin, if you're interested in that kind of thing, you go and see it, if you're not, you don't go and see it. And, and there are enough people to go and see it in Skyfall, by any standards of the series, is one of the biggest hits they've ever had. Mm -hmm. So, and that made that probably crossed over. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why it crossed over is for one very simple reason. Well, maybe two. Javier Bardem is the villain. Mm -hmm. People, people are very interested in him. No Country for Old Men and all that. And the song, which personally I think is much better than any of the films have been probably What's ever. Yeah, What's your the, favorite Bond theme? My favorite Bond theme is Living Daylight by Aha. Yeah, but, but that doesn't count because it's also your favorite song ever. It is also my favourite song ever, so we've got to take this out so of the running. But, but I think in terms of what a Bond theme should be, mm -hmm. I think Skyfall kind of transcends the limitation of Bond themes. And because it was such a huge hit everywhere, it was played on the radio, like the writings on the wall by Sam Smith or whatever it's called. Which I've already forgotten. Yeah, which we, you forget as soon as you've heard it. Like the first time I heard Skyfall, and I'm not a particular Adele fan, it's not my kind of music, mm -hmm. I'd never buy it. But, you know, there have been times when I've come in after a night at the pub and watched and listened to the song over and over again, because I think it's a very good song. <laughs> so, by, really? so by that standard, Skyfall is, by definition, a higher achievement in art than anything the Bond series has basically ever done. Mm, well, for me, say. it leads nicely into, for me, the best thing about Bond after 24 or 26 films is still the Monty Norman theme tune. Which is the, which is the one, one of the things which the, the series has to have. Which in Spectre is reserved till the final climatic battle. Mm -hmm. um, and when it does kick in, you're like, oh, finally we have like a, a film with a bit of oomph here. Because until that point, and for me, saying, it's going through the motions. You see, because when you say final climatic battle, my, the first thing I think of is in the, well, the, film is, has three. Is in the desert, yeah. which is a, a complete rehash of Quantum of Solace, mm -hmm. which everybody says was the, this mm -hmm. terrible disaster, which I think is ludicrous. Uh, the film is perfectly as good as any other Bond film recently. In fact, it's doing interesting things. It's, it's, it's trying to take things in different this directions. This is why, for me, this film is safety net filmmaking. Yeah, because, because they, they, they try so to do... They're so frightened, firstly, to go anywhere near the levels of ridicule that Die Another Day got, right? Perhaps rightly so, I don't deny it, right? Because there is a, like there is a level of inherent camp with Bond, but there is a certain gradient, and it did go too far, let's say, for the sake of argument. But with Quantum of Solace, it's like... 
you know, they did try to do something different. And look what happened. It, it did, did it, fail. It, it, well, it, you know. it, it, it made money. It just made less money than the yeah. previous one. So when Skyfall, they bring in Sam Mendes, they have Javier Bardem and all that kind of thing. And they and, and as I say, they have, they have Roger Deakins, who's one of the world's great cinematographers, shoots the hell out of it, looks fantastic on digital. They have this great song by Adele, which is on every radio station in the world almost permanently. And Skyfall, it had great reviews from the British critics who mm -hmm. seem somehow duty-bound to give every new Bond film five stars, regardless of quantum solace the exception um, mm -hmm. and as a combination of that it ended up being this huge money spinner and as I say what I, what I would like them to sort of take from that is we can actually take a few more risks with this one they don't have Roger Deakins anymore it's Hoyt van Hoytema mm -hmm. um, they don't have um, Adele you know they've got Sam Smith and things like this mm -hmm. uh, yeah so in this one you know as I say what I was hoping was a few more risks and, they, and they've kind of gone back and as you say safety, safety first mm -hmm. but the thing you've got to remember is that the, the thing that the Broccoli say to every director who takes over the franchise is don't screw it up, don't fuck it up, is what they actually say. And so, by its definition, it's, it's a safety-first franchise because it has, to be, it has to make a certain amount of money in certain territories, so you have certain things to appeal to certain demographics and things like this. And it's a very cynical money-making exercise. And within that, to expect even the risks that Fast and the Furious or Mission Impossible or the Bonner or the Bond series takes is, I think, a mistake because this, is, this has been going for 50 three years, this series, through various incarnations, all that kind of thing. It's, a, it's an established brand which will now never go away. No matter what happens, James Bond will always return. James Bond will return. As James Bond will return. At the end of all the credits, it says James but Bond will return. But what's unusual about this one is that it begins with on-screen text, the dead are alive. As if mm -hmm. to like, you know, so that also prepares us for themes and twists to come because of the certain, certain plot yeah, because But lot, uh, it's, it's also as if like to acknowledge the fact that you know, Bond's been struggling of late, even though he hasn't, but like, you know, he's seen in the eyes of, you know, a, a public that are now going to see the likes of Mission Impossible, Fast and Furious, um, the Bond trilogy, and it's like reminding us that, you know, this guy isn't finished yet. He can still jump from rooftops, he can still, you know, escape death. For me, and it might be a deliberate, a deliberate choice, it probably is, but he's, he's kind of a really sloppy, reckless field agent in this, kind of off-puttingly so. Because he's a drunk. I can't... I'm, no, 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 no. I mean in the but first... He is. He's a drunk. Yeah but, he, yeah, but in the first sequence alone... And he's right? drunk in the first sequence. Well, he might he be. He looks like he's drunk. But um, that's just Craig. Um, <laughs> But you know he's on a he's on a, a an ad hoc assassin job. We're not right? suggesting that Daniel Craig is an alcoholic, by the way. Um, and you know a building collapses during the Day of the Dead march in, in Mexico, Mexico City. City. And uh, you know the the march remains the people the participants of the march remain oblivious to this collapsed isn't, building. Isn't but it's endangering people's lives. This is a homage to Black Hat by Michael Mann, which is exactly yeah. the same thing. And so you know you watch that and you think, my God, what would happen if Michael Mann directed a Bond film? You know, A, the franchise would probably come to finally come to an end because it would be a complete disaster. B, Bond would be this brooding, silent figure in mm. fantastically well-designed apartments rather mm. than this dowdy, horrible little hole that Bond actually lives in, which we see in the film. Um, but yeah, it's, it starts off like this, and, and, and Bond is not particularly skilled. But, but it's right? something that I can't imagine Ethan Hunt doing willingly. You know, he's kind of really stubborn. It's, just, it's almost as if to say the film, the film's saying, you know... Mission Impossible is doing this, Fast and the Furious is doing this, but you know, Bond does this, like it or not, it, he's going to continue in this vein and you know, he's going to get the job done. And you know, several instances throughout the film, people ask him, why should I trust you? And he says, because I'm the only um, chance you've got. Mm -hmm. Well, trust trust is the key word of the film. The film should be called trust because every third word of di every third word of dialogue in this film is trust. It's like watching blackmail. You know, knife, knife, knife. Trust, 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 trust. Okay, it's about trust. And so what they're saying is trust us to give you the bond that you need, want, deserve, and all that kind of thing. And all right, Mission Impossible. It's 10, 20 years old, whatever it is. But we've trusted you for fifty years mm -hmm. to give us these pointless luxurious escapist thrills mm -hmm. and it is adapted to the times and now you know we've got to the point where Eon can be trusted with James Bond and what they're also saying is if Daniel Craig leaves trust us to find the replacement mm -hmm. because that's the shadow hanging over this thing because in this film obviously Bond cannot die you know the idea of killing off James Bond is you know chill but let me ask you a question right please don't get into it but I know you're a fan of Doctor Who because we'll be here all night if you begin to explain this mm -hmm. too much. But 
Doctor Who managed to incorporate the fact that a new actor had to be found into the actual world of Doctor Who. Ad so hoc. he Ad hoc. regenerates. Yeah, he regenerates right? Doctor Who. But Bond doesn't. Casino Royale took things back to the origin story because that was popular, right? But it retained certain elements, such as Judy Tench's M, mm-hmm. even though in Casino Royale he's literally earning his license to kill. Mm. Um, so because it's kind of a, an ostensibly real world setting, how does. For me, it's awkward. Well, they can't because when, when Craig leaves. Are well, they then going to do another origin story? They, well, they're, they're going to have to come up with some explanation why another person is doing it. Maybe it's a woman, maybe it's a black guy. Who knows what, how they're going to the cope when, when Craig leaves. And there's this whole thing that Craig signed for a certain number. He's debating all these things about may or, I may or may not continue. But as I say, there's no way that this can come out in the franchise in any other way than the film ends with Bond alive and mm-hmm. then the next one... Bond comes up. I mean, what they but might, I don't. I don't but, mind what, that. but what they could do is, um, ah, Bond. We will give you a new face, a new identity. Uh, Q. You know, in this one, he gets nano smart blood injection. Yeah, yeah. You know, and this is like the most invasive possible, hideous Bleed Brother technology. And it's like, oh, now you can track my every move. Yes, Bond. We know what you're going to be up to. And you're thinking, Christ, some mad scientist is going to develop this, and we're going to be all tracked by the government. Mm. You know, this whole plot of the film is about surveillance, mm-hmm. which is, of course, a very real-world thing. And it's like, in the film, all of the, the top six um, secret services in the world are going to combine their things so we're going to be spied on all the time mm-hmm. which is actually the exact same uh, gizmo as in Fast and the Furious so, and I think Mission Impossible did it as well so you know there's all this uh, future tech which is being developed and what was the what was the point that I was coming up to oh yeah um, they could easily Q could easily say step into this booth Daniel Craig Bond well, and, it's and, interesting and, and out of it pops Luke Evans or whoever it is it's interesting because you know with, with a film like Mission Impossible you suspend willingly uh, disbelief, right? Mm-hmm. And also that because yeah, the faces come face off. Yeah. But you know, with Bond, you get the sense that they're aspiring to be this kind of super serious, psychologically plausible world, right? Well, At yeah, you, the you, but, but you do have now, you know, uh, Judy Dench, uh, Oscar winner, Ray Fiennes, very serious actor, uh, Christoph Waltz, two-time Oscar winner, playing the villain, um, and so you kind of set up for something that goes a little bit deeper. And in this film, it turns out that, uh, that uh, Christoph Waltz's character, uh, Franz Oberhauser, who is later revealed as being Blofeld, is in some ways James Bond's half-brother, mm-hmm. which is a wonderful, or kind of effective brother, because he's been raised yeah. and all that kind but of thing. But it's all getting very kind of inward-looking and, like, you know, psychologically tormented. Yeah, but, but, the, but the, whole, the whole point of this is, we've set up Bond in the first three da- uh, Daniel Craig films. Now we're going to bring in Spectre, which is from the original series of films, and that means basically having to bring back Blofeld, which is what they do. And rather than just bring back both Blofeld and saying he's an evil guy who's trying to take over the world, ah, he's James Bond's brother. Mm-hmm. And there's a scene where there's glass and the two heads are kind of superimposed. Yeah. And all right, Daniel Craig and Christoph Waltz don't look that alike, but they don't look that dissimilar. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not as if he's Telly Savalas or somebody. So in this, it's like, ah, it's the mirror image of all that kind of thing. But, you know, the mirror image of, of brilliant Blofeld is kind of thick old Bond because he's not like some kind of uh, brain box. No, for me, know? for me, what makes it all awkward, right? We've, we've done Spectre, right? It's all very opportunistic to build up to their return, right, for me. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, to put it crudely, I guess, you know, come up with your own material because you're serving a, a loyal fan base or whatever, right? And, and the Bond films are serving this... this um, Return to the Connery glory years or whatever, right? But yeah, but, do you, but, but to be, what are they going to do? Completely like up with something original that's never been any well, Mission Impossible films or why Fast not? and Furious films or all these? Why not? Because that's not the way that Bond works. Bond does not strike out into, into you know, Bond's, Bond's thing was it was the original spy series, it was the original franchise, but within a year or two, you've got to carry on spying, you've got the spoofs that come. Mm-hmm. And so it's managed to ride those waves. And the way that it's ridden those waves is not by striking out into weird new directions. You know, they got George Lazenby, they married him. But what makes it awkward, what I was going to say, what makes it awkward is that, for me, it's kind of tapping into this um, growing interest, right, and popularity culturally with serial storytelling, right? So you've got, for instance, you know, Nolan's Batman trilogy, which I've already mentioned, Marvel's universe-building series and franchise, and you have the critically renowned American television series, right? And I think it's wanting to tap into that, and it's doing so without having a genuine commitment to long-term planning. 
So the, this Fulham is kind of retroactively trying to connect the previous three Fulhams, but in the previous three Fulhams, there's not really a genuine hint at you know building up to something. Well, it's, it wasn't a call, what they call retcon. You know, it's like you, what you thought you were watching was this thing, and we're going to retro, retro but it's retroactively put it together. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's shoe, creating it's, an infin it's shoe, infinite it's, regret. Yeah, but it's, it's shoehorning it in, and it's basically saying, you know, here is Blofeld. He's a much bigger deal than previously. Um, and he survives at the end of the film, so he's obviously going to come back. You're not going to have Christopher Waltz, Christoph Waltz's blow fell, then you have him once, mm. then, he, then he falls down a chimney or he's exploded or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the film, when Bond is going to shoot him, and you think, is he going to shoot me? He's not going to shoot him. Well, he's not going to shoot him because, because, he has to, be because Blofeld will return in whatever the next film is. You know, and also the girl, Leia Sedu, she she's probably going to be back in the next one because he also walks walks off into the sunset with her. But you know, that, that is the really only suspense that Bond can have now because he mm. can't die. He's been married twice before in the series. In both instances, the wife didn't survive till the end of the credits. Mm -hmm. So what a radical thing it would be for Bond to get married, for Bond to have a child. Yeah. You know, to actually take Bond in these different directions, and it is a good scriptwriter could do it, and a good director could do it. But in this one, you have teams of scriptwriters. You have John Logan. You have all these established figures. Well, there's four separate yeah. credit, uh, scriptwriters credited for this. Two teams of two, and, so that's, and then that's based on a story written by three people, two of which were part of the. Board. So it's so it's a, so it's basically it's, a, it's a committee, and it's like as as, bond the, board. as as the old saying goes, "What is a camel? The camel is a horse designed by a committee." You know, so and, well, and, and, and bond bond is the camel of these international figures because and God is a lobster. Exactly. Okay. So, but that means Yorgos Lanthimos will be directing the next film. But no, what, I, what, <laughs> but what I'm saying is to have all of these people on board, and the broccolis have got their hands here, and, and Daniel Craig is probably giving them some direction there. Mm -hmm. But at the end of it, you basically end up narrow, very narrow navigation of, of an area, mm -hmm. and and all right, a very very talented scriptwriter and director can actually navigate that way in a very interesting way. But I don't. I very rarely go to a Bond film expecting any of that. I mean, in fact, I was watching this one thinking, why am I watching this? I'm watching it partly because I want to know why certain critics have shot their load and say it's a masterpiece, mm -hmm. which it clearly isn't. Mm -hmm. I want to. Know, I might want to go and see what Christoph Waltz does with the character. In the last film, I wanted to see how Roger Deakin shot it. There's always something that I think, oh, well, I'll go and watch it yeah, for that. I, mean, I went into it with a certain level of excitement. Not really expectation, but there's always a guaranteed level of I mean, class, to put it in a certain way. But what struck me here was the first time, you know, I didn't really like any of the three um, previous Craig films, but what struck me with this one is how kind of lazily put together it is. You know, for instance, um, I think taking kind of clunky downtime in which to shoehorn some characterization in, right, like this kind of love story that, as you said, we're told about, but don't really see or feel really, and it's in this train sequence that, you know, it's not North by Northwest, it's not Cary Grant and Eva Marie Singh, it's like... Although there is that one good shot where, because the train's going through a desert and, the, and you get this big aerial shot of the train... And yeah, I mean, that's nice, nice but it's like, you know... Shot by Hoyt Van Hoytema on beautiful 35mm. But, but what, of, what, what of it? Well, what of, what of it is, that is the scene, that is the sequence which acknowledges that Bond is a figure from the past. He is travelling back in time at that mm. point because they go on a train through the desert they get off the train, they are met by a 1948 Silver Wraith and are being driven somewhere. That's right. and, at that, and, at, and at that point in the film, and he's, he's successfully got rid of the henchman who's uh, Mr. Hinks, who's basically on the one hand, all right, he's like Robert Shaw from Russia with Love, but he's also like a visitor from the Fast and the Furious universe because Bond is like, I've got my white tuxedo on, I have my beautiful woman who's dressed in old-fashioned clothes, we're on a train, we're going back in time. And the future, Dave Bautista, WWE, bursts in, tries to kill him, is dispatched, at which point they can resume their lovely journey back in time. This and, and, and Bond, I mean, Quentin Tarantino said, I will do James Bond if I can set it in 1962. <laughs> and the producers went, yeah, thanks, no thanks. <laughs> you know, so in the film, Bond acknowledges he's, you know, they keep saying, Bond, you're an anachronism, you're from the past. Oh. In the future, we have, we have surveillance technology, we have all this kind of stuff. You know, and in this, at this moment, it's like Bond will be very, very happy to go back to 1948 when that Silver Wraith was built, or 1952, mm -hmm. and we want to go back with his values were a little simpler. Exactly, perhaps. because you, you've got a character based on real life figures from the war, mm -hmm. such as Fitzroy MacLean and other people that James, uh, that uh, Ian Fleming had met. So it's it's a pre Suez vision of Englishness mm -hmm. or Britishness, which through commercial quirks and American money and various historical things, cultural things, has survived into the 21st century. 
And so it's the great thing of how, how does the, you can't do both, you know, you, you, can't, you just can't have that. Unless he's, unless he's actually a time traveller, unless he gets into his, his Aston Martin TARDIS. Whatever I told you not to speak about Doctor Who. I know, but Doctor No starts in 1962. Doctor Who starts in 1963. It's Who? a British institution played, no. by, played by various characters which came back in the 90s and then came back in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. Our friends in the North, you've got three men in it, one of them's Doctor Who, one of them's James Bond, the other one's Mark Strong, That's who probably right. will, will be a future... James Bond villain meets Doctor yeah. Who villain. So I think, you know, you cannot... To me, James Bond and Doctor Who, are, they're the brothers, and they're both the sons of Sherlock Holmes and, you know, Richard Hannay and all kind of thing. Mm. So it's a lineage. And Doctor Who has found, which was actually invented by a Canadian, bizarrely, has found a way to kind of do that and to be relevant because he can always reinvent himself, maintaining the traditional things. But as J James Bond driving in Aston Martin, it immediately becomes this exercise in nostalgia. It reminded me of the line mm. in... Um, from the Sherlock Holmes film when Basil Rathbone says to Nigel Bruce, um, and I've written down the quote, you are the one fixed point in a changing age. And he says that to Dr. Watson, which is maybe not the ideal comparison, but it's like no matter what happens in the world, ISIS is cutting people's heads off, you know, people are, uh, crazy governments being elected. Every three years we can go and see a James Bond film and it will always be the same. And for people, for people that is reassurance and, I don't, and you shouldn't kind of underestimate that. And it's it's regrettable, and I wish I, I kind of wish Bond had stopped, probably when Connery had stopped, or, or you know the Tribe with Lazenby, which I think was a very good film, you know. And at that point, they could have just said, "Tell you what, we tr Bond had had ten years, and now we're going to do other things, and we're going to do, go off and do other things." I think cinema and culture will be better off. As it is, we're kind of living in this bondified, daft position, bondage, uh, bondage, and I just think it would be kind of you know go, let's let's we should go back in the time machine, sort of forty years, and say to the producers. Connery's finished, I'll tell you what, it's like the Queen, you know, I've got no problem with the Queen, but when she's finished, let's just end the monarchy there. And it's like James Bond, when Sean Connery wants to hang his toupee up, we'll just stop. And would, would the series be any worse if they just did five of them and stopped in 1971 or, or 69, 71? Well, no, but then, you know, you'd have to go into your glorified TARDIS to do that. But we're not meant to talk about Doctor Who. I told you that. <laughs> Dear me. No, what, what did you make of Bautista? Because I know that you're a fan of Fast and the Furious. That. Films. Which, none of which I've seen. He's mm -hmm. in it? No, but he might as well be. Okay. No, for me, this was He was in Guardians of the Galaxy where he played Drax. But he actually has more than one word to say in the film. Yeah, yeah. because the point of the character in Guardians of the Galaxy is that he's a muscle creature, but he's also very, intellect, very intelligent and reads books and all that kind of thing. Like Ben Grimm. <laughs> yeah, right. so, so he's Ben Grimm in the Fantastic Four, okay. but basically in the future. So in this one, he plays Mr. Hinks, uh, very well-dressed swaggering debonair henchman who makes his appearance by appearing in a scene and putting somebody's eyeballs out with his um, silver And he fingernails. wears nail polish. What's no, he has, he has metal fingernails. Oh, is which obviously in the film yeah. is going to be some kind of character trait and then they cut it all out. So that's all come out. Yeah, I mean, what? Anyway, that, that was another symptom of this kind of awkwardness, right? Of this scene in which we, we see the Spectre members sitting around a table, right? And it's much like this, one. and it's in this like eyes wide shut like manner, right? Mm -hmm. And like Bond's on the balcony looking down, as you know, he may as well be Tom Cruise, not as Ethan Hunt, but whatever his character's called in Eyes Wide Shut, mm -hmm. looking down with this mask on. And you think like, is this going to be some kind of sex orgy? No, actually, there's very little sex or flesh in this film. But um, you know, and then Vault comes in, and it's all very strategically lit, and his face is a silhouette. And then Bautista comes in and kills somebody, and all the yeah, spectre members are just like, mm -hmm. but I mean, is, they're not but, even nodding. But it it's is, like, oh come on, it's just. But it is quite a funny scene because is it? because 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 uh, Valt says, oh, we've got to get rid of this bloke who can kill him, and this somebody that I referred to on Twitter as a loose douche <laughs> says, oh, I can uh, dispatch this person, there'll be no problem. And is there, has anybody got any objections? Then the hulking Bautista comes in and goes, oh, I put his eyes out, except he doesn't speak. So it was kind of an amusing scene. But on the other hand, you know, this scene is like, for, it's a, the film's a 12A, and I'm just thinking, how many kids in the play are going, remember that cool scene where you're like, yeah. ah! Yeah. Little, little Timmy puts his eyes out because Dave Bautista does it. <laughs> so, you know, but that's the problem with the B BBFC, not with the problem with the James Bond film. So let me ask you a final question. Who, for you, should be the next James Bond? Well, the bookies reckon it's going to be Tom Hardy, who is currently favourite ahead of Damien Lewis, Idris Elba, um, I think Dan Stevens is up there. Emily Blunt? Emily Blunt is in there with Rosamund Pike and various women. Um, there's, I'm sure they can, they're thinking of it, and it would uh, definitely reinvigorate things and probably wouldn't be such a misogynist anymore. 
my, if I was the casting director of the realistic candidates, because I can think of some excellent candidates who would be completely off the chart, would be Luke Evans, who is uh, known to American audiences as the villain from Fast and the Furious uh, 6. Uh, his most recent film is High Rise, in which uh, Ben Wheatley's completely... Oh, you love that film. Oh, it's, uh, I think, but every day. Ben Wheatley's completely hideous adaptation of J.G. Ballard, um, in which he is the only person to maintain it, or to increase his reputation. I think he's terrific in that film. Um, and I think he has... You can't praise anything without shitting on something else. This is the nature of the critic. I think that he has all the requisites, physical, character-wise, really good actor. He sings, so Bond could sing. If he could do his own Bond theme. Which, which would be a radical thing. If mm -hmm. Bond turned at the camera and started walking away. Bond should be written by Joss Whedon and we could have a musical. This, this, this could be it, but I, I think the idea of Bond singing his own credits, like, <laughs> like, a, like a Dennis Potter <laughs> thing, yeah, why you not? know, why not? Just, yeah. just try it, you know, and see what happens. So my money is on Luke Evans. I think he's good value, he's a known figure, and I just think there's going to be a grand swell as a result mm -hmm. of this conversation. And you can go to your local bookmaker and put Me? five pounds, you, okay. at the odds of 33 to 1, which mm -hmm. is terrific odds, you'll win 165 pounds with your five pounds stayed back, 170 pounds okay. if Luke Evans. But of course, Daniel Craig might do another one. I wouldn't even know what to do going into it. I'll, I'll inform you. But, but I think, I, I, I I think you go up and say, I want to back Luke Evans to be the next James Bond, and they'll write it out for you. But uh, Daniel Craig, I think, will do another one. Really? Yeah, so like people like Idris Elba will just get a bit too old. Luke Evans would be the perfect age, and I think Luke Your Evans, ages. and I think Luke Evans would be the perfect Bond. How they get him to have the face of Daniel Craig <laughs> is another matter, which I will leave to the. Brilliant, I think I think brilliant, brilliant scriptwriters. I think Daniel, my favorite Daniel Craig performance is in Munich. <laughs> uh, well, he may be a sequel to Munich, but... To, to I think in the next James Bond film, he should do Bond with the accent... So, the freaking accent, yes. Munich. Yes, uh, the, any, the, what is it? The, the only blood I'm interested in is Jewish blood. Is he in chat? <laughs> uh, I think, I think uh, Shalto Copley should be the next uh, James Bond. That would be Bond, very good. And he would do it entirely with motion capture, uh, directed by Neil Blomkamp. But who would do? You? Who would I? I put oh, it to you. Oh my goodness, that's a very good question. I haven't really thought about it. When I asked you, I didn't really have anybody in mind. Um, I mean, you know, I love Paddy Considine, but he's not really a Bond. And also, every actor who I like, right, including mm -hmm. Idris Elba, mm -hmm. I don't think should lure themselves to this franchise. Luke Evans started in musical theatre, so... Right? Yeah, but musical theatre is better than Bond. Andrew Lloyd Webber. I take your point. Mm. Well, look, there we are. Lloyd, Lloyd Webber writes the theme tune, and, and Luke Evans sings it. So I, if that, I would be the first buying a ticket if that happens. Hold on, who's writing it? Me in collaboration with Andrew Lloyd Webber. I, I, I okay. take over from Tim Rice to do right. the lyrics, and Lloyd Webber does the music. Right. So and Luke can, Evan, I, can I be James Bond? Um, anybody can be James Bond. It's in, in, you know, if you dream hard enough and work hard enough, by the time Daniel Craig retires, this is the face of 007.